I have been asked to speak very slowly for the benefit of the translators. Uh, this is going to be difficult for me because even in the United States, people tell me that I talk too quickly. So uh, I'm going to try to speak. I'm going to target 50% normal <laughs> speed. And so just remember, by the end of this, however much you enjoy my talk, normally it's twice as good. <laughs> So I'm going to, our, our panel this morning is on uh, taxes, and specifically about tax harmonization, FACTA, things of that nature. But let me first just make some general remarks about how economists normally analyze uh, tax structures, because I think there's uh, what general, the general public doesn't realize is that uh, high marginal tax rates are very destructive and inefficient in ways beyond simply how much money goes to the government. Right? So let me just uh, explain some of those principles so you understand the concepts here. So th again, that, that first uh, principle I want to get across is that to, to understand the harmful consequences of uh, high taxes, really the, the impact is that it distorts behavior. So much of economic science going back to Adam Smith in 1776 and even earlier than that, much of what economists have done is to study and explain how uh, market prices give proper signals to people in the market so that producers end up doing the things that's in the public interest. So even though each uh, producer is just trying to make a profit, so long as there's uh, solid property rights and the uh, legal system is ordered correctly and so forth, that individual business people trying to earn the maximum profit, they indirectly or unwittingly end up doing what the public would want them to do in the general interest. Right? So that's the, the normal baseline of a, of a market economy and that's partly the the discovery that was so amazing that you know, started economists for the last several hundred years studying this, this amazing uh, fact of how the world works. So the problem is when the government levies large tax rates, it interferes with that mechanism. It, it distorts those signals that the market prices are giving. So just to give you some simple examples to make sure you understand the, the concept and how it operates, imagine there's an individual who is very talented and he's trying to decide between two jobs. And so one job is very leisurely working at a bookstore. And he sits behind the counter and customers come in very slowly and he talks to them and they say what books they're interested in, he points them out and he drinks tea and gets to read most of the day. And so that's a very pleasant job and he might enjoy that, get a lot of personal satisfaction but the salary is very low. And then in contrast, perhaps he also has the ability, he could go to uh, a, a corporate office in the downtown area where the job is very stressful and he has to work, work long hours and maybe if there's a, a major deal that his firm is working on, you know, he has to go in on Saturday and Sunday and, and so he's, he is always stressed out. But, the, but, he, but his skills are very useful there. So in a market economy, that individual has the freedom of choice. No outside person can force him to work at the one job or the other, but there does need to be a way that society sort of lets him know how much they would rather he do the one job versus the other. And so in a market economy, it's the, the salary or the wage that conveys that information. So ultimately, it's his decision, but in a sense, if that high, if the very stressful corporate job would pay five times as much, then he gets the information he needs to make the decision. So it's it's not that he's um, forbidden from taking the leisurely job at the bookstore, but the point is he needs to know how much does society value my labor effort in this job versus this job. Because there's lots of people who could work at the bookstore whereas perhaps his skills are fairly unique in the, in the corporate niche, and so that's why he's able to earn such a high salary there if he chooses. So the problem is that 
normally the, the market signals convey the right information for him to make that choice, but if there's a very high marginal income tax rate, that the information to him gets distorted, that a lot of the extra salary that the market is willing to pay him, the government takes <coughs> through, through high marginal income tax rates. And so if the individual is, is now considering working at the bookstore, what would be my after-tax income, like how much I actually get to spend on myself, versus working at the downtown stressful job with that after-tax income, now those numbers are a lot closer. So the, so the point of that story is to say he's not fully taking into account how much more society values his effort at the, at the high productivity occupation because he's not allowed to keep that extra income that it generates, the government takes it. So in a case like that, suppose he decides to work at the bookstore, it's the, the harm to that is not simply the amount of revenue that goes to the government when it taxes his smaller income, the actual economic damage occurs because he's not working at the job where he's actually producing more as appraised by his neighbors, right? Indirectly through the market process, the fact that he could have earned a much higher salary in a way is the market signal saying, this is how much we would value if you were to work over here and yet he's not, he's not getting that information. All right, so that's just one example. Uh, another category of waste that is caused by or, or encouraged by high tax rates is when businesses, uh, when, when they engage in, in profligate spending. So for example, a, a corporation, when it's deciding uh, to renovate its lobby, if there's high marginal tax rates on corporate income, well then from the corporation's point of view, let, let's, let's say the tax rate is 50% on, on corporate income. From the corporation's point of view, if they spend a lot of money getting nice couches and, and fancy uh, marble top counters for when the people come in and chandeliers and fountains and so forth, that's very beautiful and, and very elegant, from, to the corporation, it's as if those things only cost one half as much as the actual price tag because they can count those as business expenses. And so if they spend whatever 10,000 euros renovating the lobby to make it look very beautiful, really that only reduces their after-tax profits by 5,000 euros because if they, if they earn the 10,000, then that would have been taxable income and they would have had to give 5000 to the government. So the idea is they can effectively acquire $10,000 worth of renovations and really only make their profit, their after-tax profit, go down by 5,000 euros. So again, it gives the wrong incentive that businesses um, will spend more on things that can be classified as business expenses than they would at a lower tax rate. And this is why you see you know, businesses taking fancy uh, trips when they when they want to have a meeting and have their executives from around the country go meet somewhere, they might meet at a fancy place in a nice hotel that really doesn't make much sense economically. It's sort of wasteful, but it's partly encouraged by the tax code. Another example uh, concerns the treatment of debt versus equity. So for here, for corporations, if if the way the tax law is structured is that when a corporation makes interest payments on bonds, that that's a business expense, but if the corporation makes dividend payments to the shareholders, that's not a deductible business expense. If that's the way the tax code works, it gives an artificial incentive for corporations to raise money using debt rather than equity. So, for example, if a corporation wants to build a new factory, let's say they, they need to raise 100,000 euros, there's two ways they can do it. They can issue more bonds, so they can borrow the money, or they can issue more stock, and so more people become shareholders in the company. And there's pros and cons of, of those two methods, but issuing, <coughs> issuing debt, one of, the, one of the downsides is that it makes the corporation more vulnerable, that if they have losses, it's harder to bear those if they have higher debt. And so perversely, 
the way if the tax code is structured so that interest payments to bondholders is a deductible expense, again, that makes them more likely to raise the 100,000 euros issuing bonds because then when they pay the interest to those people, that reduces their taxable income. Whereas if they raise the $100,000 by selling stock, when they distribute the profits to those people, that's not, that doesn't reduce their taxable income. So again, you can just see how the uh, tax code artificially affects behavior in ways that we wouldn't want it to do. In general, if someone said, hey, should we have a government policy that makes corporations become more leveraged? Most people would say, no, why would we do that? We would rather they be less leveraged so that they're less vulnerable to a, to a negative shock. Okay, let me uh, say one last issue on the, the perversity of the tax code, and then I'll move on to uh, some of the problems facing us today. The last issue is what you may often hear called a, a double tax on savings. And so here, the, the idea is that economists will point out a tax on income is more damaging than a tax on consumption. And, and the way they will express that, to repeat myself, is to say it's, it's like a double tax on savings. So if the way it works is that if you earn, let's say, a, a thousand euros, and then you want to spend it, if it's taxed on consumption, then your trade-off is to say, okay, I can buy something today, and it gets taxed at, at when I consume, when I, when I buy a television set or a car, or maybe I want to wait and spend it in the future. And so I take my thousand euros and I invest it, and it earns income, either you know a capital gain in the stock market, or it earns interest if I buy bonds or you know, put it in a, in a bank that pays interest. And so if it's just being taxed at the point of consumption, then I'm either going to pay it now when I buy the television set, or down the road in the future when I buy the television set. And so my decision as to whether to spend now or in the future is not affected by the tax. My decision whether to earn more income is, is affected. I might not work as much, but the point is once I get my income, I will make the correct decision in terms of how much do I want to spend now versus how much do I want to defer gratification and spend in the future, and the interest rate helps me make that decision. But if, if instead of taxing it at the level of consumption, the government taxes it at the, when income is generated, now the decision gets distorted. So not only Am I poorer because the government's taking my income? But if I get my thousand euros right now, and let's say the tax is 10%, I have 900 euros, and then I can spend on consumption today, buy television sets and things today. But if I want to defer it, and that generates interest, that's income, and so I get it gets taxed again. So it artificially penalizes savings behavior. It, taxing income if interest and dividends and capital gains are included in what counts as income, it's, it artificially distorts people's decisions to make them consume today rather than wait. So again, in general, if I had just asked you, do you think the government should be encouraging people to not save as much, to consume now rather than saving for the future, most people would say no, that saving is good, we want to encourage thrift. But again, the, the tax code by taxing income beyond <coughs> the, the, the level of money or euros flowing to the government, beyond that obvious impact is the fact that it distorts behavior and, and lowers saving. And in the long run, that's what reduces economic growth. The society is not saving and investing as much. Okay, so let me uh, explain now something more pertinent to the current situation. Think first about how does a cartel work, right? Like the OPEC nations, the, the problem they face, right, if they're all selling oil, is they would like to be able to restrict production and raise the price of oil. But the problem is unilaterally any one country would have the incentive to increase output and sell oil a little bit below what everyone else is doing in the group and attract more market share. So the way historically that business people get around that is they form an agreement or a cartel and the best thing is if they can get some government agency to enforce that, right, to keep everybody agreeing to the cartel. So we can totally see how that works when it comes to something like OPEC. 
And I want to say that's a good model to understand this drive for tax harmonization, that any individual country in the Eurozone, for example, realizes if we just reduce our taxes on the margin a little bit compared to all of our neighbors, we're going to get this big inflow of capital, workers, um, and so on, and we'll, we'll generate more income, we'll have higher tax receipts, but then that means their neighbors would have the incentive to do the same thing. So it's the governments would be competing against each other for shares of the tax market or the tax base market. And so how can, if they don't want that to happen, how can they do, how can they get around that? They can have a, uh, an agreement to all raise their tax rates simultaneously enforced by these extra national organizations. And so far from ensuring simplicity and uniformity and all the, the good things that are given in terms of praising tax harmonization, I would say it's the exact opposite that we should view it as a insidious means by which all the governments are going to agree to raise tax rates and minimize the, the damage to any individual from what they would consider as cheating. Thank you. Uh,